Welcome to Charity Village Connects. Today we're speaking with Susan Mannering. Susan is a recognized leading legal expert advising social enterprises, charities, and nonprofits. And Susan is the national lead of the social impact group at Miller Thompson. Susan was appointed as a member of the Canada Revenue Agency Consultation Panel on Political Activities of Charities and appointed to the Government of Canada's Advisory Committee on the Charitable Sector, among many other important appointments related to charity law and her work with nonprofits. Welcome to the podcast, Susan. Thanks, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start with the fundamentals, and perhaps for our audience, you could provide some background and an introduction to Bill S-216 and what it proposes to change. The Income Tax Act today has a framework within which charities are required to operate. And in that framework, it basically says that a charity can do work, to can do its mission itself, so can do the work itself in the sense that it's its own activity, or that the charity can make grants to qualified donees. Qualified donees is a category of organization which is defined in the Income Tax Act, and it's basically um, other Canadian registered charities. There are some other entities that are in the definition, but the largest bulk is other Canadian registered charities. So if you stand back from that, what I'm saying is a charity has to do its own work, or it can make a grant to another Canadian registered charity. So when you think about that framework and you think about charities' work, you start to understand what Bill S-216 is directed at. The reality is Canadian registered charities work with many organizations that are not Canadian registered charities. And that happens internationally in particular. Many Canadian organizations are working with third parties on the ground in many international countries. But it also happens in Canada, in Indigenous communities, and in other organizations in Canada. And when they work with these non-charities, they are working to further their own activity, but they're not always running the program themselves. They're, it's not always something that that is their activity. They're working in collaboration with other groups. So because the Income Tax Act doesn't really permit the transfer of resources to something that's not a charity, over the years, uh, lawyers like me and others in the in the charitable that work with the charitable sector have you know come up with agreements and ways to work with these organizations that aren't charities that permit the allocation of resources to these programs in a way that either tries to make them the own activities of the charity or in in for sure makes it clear it's not a grant to the non charity so that they're in compliance with the income tax act. And many of these arrangements are somewhat artificial. They comply, they ensure that the money is being spent the way it should be, but they're cumbersome, they're bulky, and and most particularly, they contain a requirement that the Canadian charity organization has the last say, is directing and controlling what's going on. And and that is um, problematic for many groups who work alongside the charity who need to be making the decisions, have the experience and probably the expertise to make better decisions than the actual Canadian charity, but are are sort of forced into a role that feels somewhat subservient because of these direction and control rules. When Senator Ahmedvar uh, worked in a charity years ago, I think she ran into this and she found it Um, quite difficult and to be quite an unhelpful allocation of resources to try to find your way through these provisions. So S216 was something she wanted to champion because it's intended to rethink that framework and to turn it into a scenario where the Income Tax Act will permit a Canadian charity to work with a non-charity provided they know that the programming they're doing is furthering charitable purposes, but in a way that doesn't require this direction and control or require the, this fiction that somehow whatever is being done is the own activity of the charity. Okay, so there's multiple issues in that, in that actual, multiple points that I want to address in, in our chat together. Uh, I, the first one I would say is, is that, you know, I have heard you before, I think in a webinar that um, 
that the bill would provide more transparency and accountability and, and eliminate this kind of legal fiction that you're referring to, that the present law sort of forces organizations, charities to, uh, and the organizations that may not be a qualifying uh, charity to actually endure in this relationship. Can you, can you sort of explain what you mean by that? Well, I think, I think that, you know, it starts with the concept um, let's say I'm an education charity and, and I'm supposed to be teaching something, but you, Mary, are doing a different teaching thing in your own role that is, is you know, you've done for a number of years, let's say it's teaching on public policy or something separate. And, and yet all of a sudden I have a program where I want, I think it's important that you should be able to provide some help to some, some of my beneficiaries. And so all of a sudden, instead of you doing it on your own, I'm sort of saying your activity is my activity. It's sort of, it's artificial. It doesn't make sense that I can't give you some resources to help you go out and run that program on your own, but in a manner which helps me with the beneficiaries that I have as a charity. So what I think, what the, the, what would be helpful is if we understand in the law that we are transferring assets or we are giving resources to an organization that's not a charity and that we report on the reason we're giving them is because they're doing something that is consistent with our charitable purpose, but it is them that's doing it. It's not us that's doing it. And that's the, that's the artificiality. And, you know, some of the agreements where we say it's, it's actually my charity's activity, not yours, uh, not your organization's, it's really not, if you really look at the actual work being done, you're, you would be doing most of it. So it really does show up as, as sort of artificial when you look at it. Whereas if we had a system, which Bill S216 um, supports, where I could actually, in my reporting, in my description of what I'm doing, be very clear that I'm directing resources to a non-charity to do something for the for the work that I do that will further my purpose. And then, you know, the reality is you would then report on how you do what you're doing and it would be consistent. So it wouldn't be trying to me trying to own what you do. And um, and there are various different ways that we find this in coming out. Sometimes it's in collaborations, sometimes it's in um, you know, joint projects. It's it's very important that that we should be able to distinguish who's doing what, but we're forced into these artificial type relationships where we're not actually transparent about that. I see. So, you know, what I've heard Senator Omidvar in our discussions with her as well. She believes that the present rules that regulate how a charitable organization is able to work with community groups, for example, that don't have charitable status are way too complex, difficult for charities to navigate, and are a deterrent to funds getting fr to the groups on the front lines that are doing the work. Is that something that you see in your practice? Do you agree with that assessment? You know what? I do. And I think we see it in, in a couple of different ways. First off, there are 80... 4,000, 85,000 charities in Canada. Um, many of them are smaller. They're not, they're not large organizations, but they do great work working alongside non-charities. Those organizations hear about these rules, start to understand them, and they basically back away. They don't feel they have the resources to try to figure out how they can be in compliance, and it becomes too complicated. Then you have the very large, you know, well, some larger organizations who run into these rules and say, I'm just risk adverse. We don't want to be in a situation where we're concerned that, you know, we're putting in the requirements for direction and control or trying to show this as a, an agency type relationship will actually expose our organization to greater risk for some of the activity or may not, we may not want to be trying to direct and control these people. So CRA may feel that we're not doing what we need to do. So there's lots of organizations who decide that they're just going to restrict their work with other registered charities. So that does 
have an impact on how broadly people are are working for purposes of the uh, the activity that's being pursued. This the second thing that happens is that there's there are there's a lot of investment in agreements and reporting and relationships that go along with the direction and control regime that has been basically what we've been following for the last you know 40 50 years and and you know no one is saying they don't want to be accountable but a lot of the reporting and some or some of the reporting and the requirements and the nature of the agreements are just complicated enough that they require lawyers to help with them and then they require extra work to be done at the staffing level to really ensure that they're being complied with and uh, my experience with CRA is is that they're very clear that you should have these kinds of agreements make sure they're in place and that you should follow them which makes sense but it is you know getting all those expense reports finding out how things are being done disclosing everything back and forth between the two organizations can be very cumbersome and time time consuming for both organizations to bring together. So I think what Senator Ahmed Bars, that's that's where she's looking at is are we efficiently using charitable dollars to to really achieve the charitable work we're trying to do or are, are, is the current system getting in the way? And I think many people think that it's getting in the way. And um, I've also heard the senator um, stating her belief that the the current system really perpetuates a kind of arcane law that for many people represents um, a sort of a a feeling of neo-colonialism and paternalism because of the re- the actual words being used, the rules referring to a requirement of direction and control. When charities are working with non-charity partners uh, who are doing the frontline work with underrepresented groups, for example, indigenous organizations supporting their communities. And I'm very curious about what your thoughts are around that. Have you experienced that in, in your work? Um, I've certainly experience the pushback. Clients have, have said, we have to have the direction and control. And the other organization said, whoa, that doesn't work. That's exactly what we're trying to work against. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about this is the words direction and control are not in the Income Tax Act. They have been adopted by the Canada Revenue Agency and their administrative guidance as a result of comments made by court decisions, um, which are probably a, a sample of how bad facts make bad law, um, I don't. It, but but the requirement for that direction and control has been felt by many of these non-charity partners as something that is very offensive and very problematic. And you know, my experience is. What is generally happening when we work with a charity and a non-charity is that you have a very good meaning, well-meaning charity that wants to support some excellent work on the ground that may be done by a non-charity, let's say, in the Indigenous community. Um, Many Indigenous organizations don't want to register as a charity for various reasons, for structural reasons, for historic reasons, for the the relationship of governments. and the work that is needed to be done is charitable. But the notion that the Canadian charity would somehow have to be approving everything that's happening or that the organization on the ground, the non-charity partner, couldn't have decision making involved definitely gets in the way. And that's and that's where I think Senator Ahmedvar view, Ahmedvar's view comes from. It's where many other um, comment, much of the commentary we're hearing in the last couple of years is coming from that, that the notion that the Canadian charity directs and controls the work, I mean, is, is problematic because it doesn't help to build sustainability. It doesn't help to build capacity by suggesting that, that the decision maker is the Canadian charity. And generally, the you know the the largely the, the Canadian charities with a lot of money tend to represent a particular part of our population that is perceived to be um, you know it, that taken together with that there is there tends to be a problem. The um, I think you know I, I I really don't know for sure. I mean the whole concept of charity has come out of 
16th, 17th century England and feudal times. So there is a very paternalistic type approach to the common law of charity. So it's it's almost inherent in the charitable system that you're, you know, you're relieving people's poverty, you're giving alms to the poor. And the reality is that today we are supposed to be doing something, you know, much different than that. We want to speak about it much differently than that. So I think it's it's all a part of that that we're seeing uh, in the reaction. But helping our system by getting rid of direction and control would certainly take us forward if we could create a uh, framework where we could work alongside non-charity partners and work with them, that would be, I think, would go a long way to removing this this view. Well, I, I want to sort of um, address this issue of uh, working with Indigenous or BIPOC charities um, or non-charitable organizations. I've spoken to some for this podcast who say that there are many Indigenous and BIPOC charities that charities can easily work with under the present system, but the money just isn't flowing for reasons that there just isn't a will to do so among many foundations and charities, and that it has little to do with the complexity that spons- the, the complexity that the sponsors of this bill say is the deterrent to this money flowing to those frontline workers, those community groups, and that it's really a deeper problem than, than technical issues. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about that observation. I think the reality is that there are issues about how we fund organi- you know, in our communities that there are racialized communities that have have less have seemingly had less access to funding indigenous communities who have struggled and the reasons are many i don't think you can point to one area or another for the for the solution i think that the solution however is in order to enable it we have to remove the barriers that we can I mean, society has changed dramatically in the last hundred years, and we hope it continues to change and that we do become um, a society where where we don't see these prejudices apply in decision making. But um, more for me, removing the issues in the Income Tax Act that get in the way is just one great step forward to achieving that. And yes, we have to do things other things as well, and we have to educate and teach or other people how, how to fund and how to look at funding opportunities. But I don't think you can suggest that moving forward with this isn't going to be helpful because it's going to remove a barrier that people use as an excuse today. And that will help us get more money to those organizations and communities. And I just was wondering about your... Um... I've spoken to some people who have concerns about a potential lack of oversight and governance that this new structure may create. And I and I know that there are safeguards built into the bill, and I'm curious what your thoughts are around them. Are they sufficient? Um, what are they exactly? So the way the bill is proposed, um, it, it removes the requirement that you have to somehow say the work that's being done by the non-charity is my activity. So it, rem- it, it gets rid of that. But it doesn't say that I don't have to be careful who I'm granting to or who I'm working with. It requires me to do my due diligence. It requires an organization to do background checks, to understand what the work is going to be. It's, it doesn't say there has to be something in writing, but it suggests that you have to have a framework around it, that you have to be able to get reports, that you have to be able, the organization that the charity is working with has to be able to demonstrate that it's doing what it says it's going to do. It's the same work that registered charities do when they grant to other registered charities in many programs where they're directing something to a particular program. But what it it is suggesting is that it doesn't require the direction and control so that the work of the registered charity would be upfront, ensuring they're working with a partner that they feel can achieve the purposes and can, and can proceed to do the work. And then we'll provide the reporting to the work, to do the work. And the, the way it's drafted, in my view, it will permit the same type of guidance to be issued by the Canada Revenue Agency around 
the types of reports they would like to see, to put in some suggestions to how a charity can ensure the, the work furthers their charitable purpose without having the charity say it's mine, without the charity having to own it in that way, which is really the fundamental difficulty. And, you know, I, I, I often say to people when I work in public policy and we're trying to come up with new legislative regimes, um, uh, this is this. Is, I don't want this to come across the wrong way. I think the system we've recommended work will work. I think it requires a reasonableness standard. It suggests that charities have to do their due diligence. They have to take steps, and it specifically requires that for a registered charity to do that work. Um, today, there are even under the direction and control system, there are abuses that happen. And those are because people intentionally want to do things that are outside of the Income Tax Act and they won't want to do things improperly. There's no change we make that will ever guarantee that that doesn't happen because people who want to break the law will break the law. But I don't see that this new system really is increasing the risk of that. I think the new system is very similar to the system in the U.S., it's very similar to the system that has been used for years in the United Kingdom. And we don't, we don't in, in England, we don't, there's not a large number of charities being losing their charitable status because they haven't been spending their uh, funding properly. properly. They're actually, you know, and similarly in the U.S. So I think sometimes I find the concern that this is going to open it up to be a little bit more of that paternalistic sort of, oversight from a perspective of only we can do good that that these organizations aren't going to comply and i i find that a bit troubling and and i also think it's hard to to evidence it but i'm quite comfortable that the way this system would work would be in line with how we've been working with non-charity partners till now without those artificial distinctions and without seemingly imposing direction and control on the non-charity partner. And uh, to me, that would be a breath of fresh air. <laughs> well, outside of Bill um, S-216, are there other areas you'd like to see charity or nonprofit legislation modernized in Canada? I'm very curious because of your work in uh, social um, social enterprise and other areas of impact. Um, is there anything that you'd like to also see change that we should have on our radar? Well, I mean, I think it would be really, um, it would be very positive if we could find a way to um, permit charities to raise money through revenue generation in a way that is far more um, open than what it is today. So there's the, there's this concept of destination of funds test, which of course the government is not happy with, but the charity raising money in any way, as long as those funds are going to the charitable work is okay. I'm not sure we need to go that far, but we currently have another sort of, it's not really a fiction, but this concept of related business where charities are trying to use their resources to generate revenue and they have to come to people like me to find out if they're onside or offside the rules, which again gets in the way of charities being more innovative and creative. I would like to see that work better. Um, I think the system for nonprofit organizations that aren't charities needs to be shifted a bit because there really isn't a lot of regulation there. And I'm not wanting it to be more restrictive, but it would be nice if the public knew more because we don't want there to be a loss of trust in the work that's being done. And sometimes because they're they're not filing returns like a registered charity that are publicly available and they're not on the radar screen of, of CRA as much, that they tend to get thrown out as a reason why maybe if we let charities do things, it might not go as well. So so that may be an area of change. Um, you know, we also know that that CRA is looking at or the Department of Finance is looking at other changes with the disbursement quota. Um, defining administrative and management expenses, which I don't really understand how they will do that, but I'm very curious. So there's lots of things like that that are coming, but I, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to those, but I would like to see a little bit more of a modern approach. We we don't trust, I mean, it's what's really interesting is the 
Canadian tax system is based, uh, is a self-assessment tax system. It basically trusts Canadians to file their tax returns honestly, to report their income honestly, and to pay their taxes honestly. And and the charity system's embedded in that. But, but and, and we've kept that system. We've, you know, we seem to think it works. But sometimes I feel like the rules for charities, it's the one area where we don't seem to want to trust them as much as we trust everybody else. And, you know, I'm not sure, I just sometimes think we should let charities have more um, flexibility in doing their good works and put less specific constraints on them. And that's what I would like to see as we modernize the act. Well, Susan, it looks like we'll have a lot more to talk about in the future. Um, I really want to thank you for your insight and giving such a clear understanding to our audience of the issues and the rationale for Bill S-216 and, and its potentially important impact on the nonprofit sector should it, should it pass. We will be following the progress of the bill in the coming weeks and months. So thank you for joining us and giving us this valuable, valuable insight. You're welcome very much, Mary. It was my pleasure, and I'm always happy to chat about uh, all things charity. Thank you.